Okay, so this morning you've got me introducing. Hello everybody, good morning. Morning. Uh, thank you, yeah, morning. Lovely to hear you all. Uh, thank you for joining us on day three. Um, we hope that uh, you've enjoyed the conference as much as we have so far. Last night I was thinking back to last year's conference. It was my first ICS conference um, and I came away actually absolutely exhausted but with a real sense of what ICS is about and how precious the community time and fellowship is. And, and I don't know about you, but this week I felt the same excitement um, about gathering together and the joy of seeing familiar faces and the sense of community, even over Zoom, which I, I think is amazing. Um, so obviously at this point I'd like to welcome you, but it would be remiss of me as social media administrator not to plug our social media at this point. Um, so if you haven't already, please join our prayer group that's on Facebook. Um, it's wonderful to hear from you through the comments and the likes. So uh, please, please do join us there. I'll send a link out later. Uh, so before I hand over to Ben, let's just pray. Father God, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for the joy and sense of community you've given us this week, even while so far apart. Thank you for the worship and for the teaching this week. And we ask that you would bless us as we gather together on this final day and unite us in faith. Amen. Amen. Over to Ben. Thank you. Um, not much to say other than uh, we're going to sing in just a moment. And hopefully it's a, a hymn that you recognise and it's been drawing on some of Simon's themes of uh, love and uh, being held and carried in love. Um, and... I don't know, the gospel reading for many of us this Sunday is the road to Emmaus. And I love those words that uh, set our hearts on fire with love for you. And uh, in a sense, that's my prayer for us this morning. So let's sing together as we uh, sing together. Here is love. The night has passed and the day lies open before us. So may the light of your presence, O God, set our hearts on fire with love for you now and forever. Amen. Amen. Great. Thank you, Ben. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Robin. I agree. Great song. One of the things that came out of the discussion group yesterday was that wouldn't it be good to have the workshops from the conference or have an opportunity to talk about some of the issues that are cropping up to us really uh, focused at the moment. So what was suggested was would we be able to have a, a workshop about how do we lead in a time like this and it doesn't need to be well produced but somebody introduces it then we break into groups then there's a plenary where we learn from each other and that's it. So next Thursday at 11 o'clock Central European time Clive Atkinson will be introducing the theme of how do I lead in this time. Clive is the chaplain in Veve. Clive is very clear that he's not introducing the answers, he's setting a framework for our discussion. And then we can talk about, well, what does it mean for us as leaders in this moment? I think it's a great idea and really relevant. And I think we need to respond quickly to do it. Secondly, we wanted then also to have uh, another session, perhaps a week later, which starts to think about what's it like to minister post this time. There is a great article which I'll send around to you later. It's called Leading Beyond the Blizzard uh, by Andy Crouch. Um, and a lot of us mission agencies have been discussing it because it gives an idea of what's it going to be like post this time. Um, and so I'll send it to you to read rather than try to badly summarise it for you. Uh, and you'll get that today. So that's all said. I had an opportunity yesterday to interview Bishop Robert, and I'm, I'm going to play that interview in a moment. Um, what I want to say really is, yesterday before I interviewed Robert, I made a point of changing my shirt so the continuity looked really good. So when you see this interview, it looks like it's happening straight away, but it's really not. This morning, it's great that we've got Bishop Robert with us. 
this has been recorded because of diary conflicts, but it's been recorded recently, so it's still very fresh. Good morning, Bishop Robert. Good morning, Richard, and, uh, and hello to all of you at the conference. I miss being with you physically, but it's a joy to be with you uh, via this recorded Zoom conversation. So tell me, how are you and Helen uh, experiencing lockdown? How is it from your perspective? So I'm sitting here in our, our, our nice house in Waterloo in, in, uh, in the south of Brussels. We have a nice garden and, and it's been beautiful weather for the last five weeks. So we, we have an extraordinary sense actually of blessing and, and thanksgiving actually despite all that's going on around us um, of course we very much miss our family as I'm sure uh, m my fellow clergy are doing too they would have been all visiting us at Easter but we had to cancel all the flights and so it was just the two of us here over Easter uh, nonetheless we do appreciate the uh, stillness and the calm um, a friend of mine gave me a bird song app and uh, for the first time ever, I've been attending to the bird song and identifying the birds. And uh, Dale Hansen uh, showed real appreciation of that. And uh, and then uh, I've also got a, a night uh, a night time star application, which uh, enables me to look at the stars. And I'm hoping to watch the shooting stars tonight. And a red squirrel has joined us in the garden as well. So so I'm very thankful for that. I'm just aware of how different it is for me from you know those living in tower blocks or cramped circumstances or difficult relationships so i have a lot i have a lot to be thankful for thank you richard yes and i'd be interested um what has surprised you through this time um about the diocese but also about your own experience of it as well yes um well i'm i i'm i've been really positively surprised actually and 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 genuinely uh, delighted at how quickly we as church have adapted uh, to the loss of our, our buildings. Uh, we always imagine ourselves as a kind of slow moving institution that, you know, we take decades or centuries to change, but we, we've adapted really fast. Uh, we've learned something which we always knew was true, but sometimes forget, which is the church is the people, not the buildings. Um, uh, uh, we're more resilient as a church than we might have expected and uh, and I've been deeply impressed by the imagination and creativity of our clergy and our working together with senior staff has been has been you know, really excellent so so I've been pleasantly uh, uh, pleased and surprised by that and then what else have I learned well I've learned that actually uh, and this is you know in terms of the deprivations I do miss the physical contact with people um, and I do like being with people and I miss that and I miss uh, Holy Communion and the physicality and the sacramentality of the gathered fellowship around the Lord's table sharing bread and wine and fasting from Holy Communion for me has proved a real uh, privation and uh, and I long to uh, to resume that whenever it's possible yes yes now the people who are listening or watching at the moment uh, mainly in Europe, but some people in the Middle East, and it'll go more widely. We had people in uh, North Africa as well. Um, but on the whole, it's Europe that's got the most people there. So what would you want to say to us all? Um, well, I want to say a big thank you to all the clergy of our diocese and their families who are doing amazing work. Uh, in, in stressful um, and difficult circumstances. Um, and of course, with the uncertainty of not knowing um, uh, how, how much longer this will go on, except that it probably will go on for really quite a long time. Um, so uh, I think you are doing a fantastic job. <laughs> so, uh, and I, it's always good to be in touch with you. Um, I hope that you feel the support you receive from the diocese from Friends ICS is adequate for you and I pray for you. Uh, I suppose I'm personally wondering about, about restart um, as certain European countries are beginning to relax very gradually and very cautiously the restrictions on us. 
I'm wondering how will we adapt to that as, as church? What will, let us say, the new diocese in Europe look like? Uh, what positives are we going to include going forward? Uh, um, and, um, and how do we think about what that church will feel like? Not, not just pragmatically, but also theologically. Um, what are we learning theologically about this sense of exile, this, also the sense of prayerfulness about ecology and care for one another? So, so I want to say I hope that we're all taking some opportunity to reflect deeply on, on what's happening to us and where we're going and to do that in a theological as well as practical way. Marvellous. Thank you for taking the time. Please send our love to Helen. Thank you very much, Bishop Robert. Thank you very much indeed, Richard, and have a great conference, everybody. Bye-bye for now. Simon, we've been so blessed by your ministry amongst us. Ben, if you could unmute Simon for us, that'd be helpful. Let me just pray for you and for us, Simon, as you open the Word of God this Thursday. Heavenly Father, we pray for Simon. We pray for what he's prepared, for what your Spirit lays on his heart. But we pray also for us in our dispersed locations that we're sensitive to what you're saying to us. We long for more of that dynamic sense of your spirit leading us, speaking to us. May this moment be just that time. In Christ's name, amen. Richard, thank you. And uh, thank you, team, for the invitation. Uh, real privilege and a real joy to spend these few mornings with you and just opening up the word of God and uh, trying to draw nearer to the Lord who draws near to us. What an amazing and inspirational ministry ICS is. Uh, this morning I'd like us to look at John chapter 20 and starting at verse 10. John 20 beginning at verse 10. And uh, Mary has gone early to the tomb and found it empty. And she's run back to tell the disciples and Peter and John have run to the tomb and seen it was empty and then they've left, but she has stayed. Verse 10. Then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked a woman, why are you crying? They've taken away my Lord, she said, and I don't know where they've put him. At this she turned round and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. And Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned towards him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. A couple of days ago, or just before the, the weekend, I walked out of my house only to see uh, an unusual woman, not known to me, in her 30s, sat cross-legged at the entrance to my drive. And she was sobbing her heart out. So, keeping a safe distance, I asked her what the matter was and if I could help in any way. And she replied, I haven't touched one living soul in a month. The fact is we're created for connection and uh, this isolation at this time is almost a dehumanization and here was this woman who lived on her own separated from connection to others and she was overcome by it and feeling that she was dissolving. And She told me that she had left her flat so she could uh, find a space and a place where she could cry without annoying her neighbours. 
I shared a few rather pathetic words and uh, then I went and got my wife Tiffany but when Tiffany came out to talk to her she'd already got on a bicycle and gone. But I've been thinking about this woman all week. A woman sat on my drive in tears and I wish I'd said more and I wish I'd done more. So many tears are falling to the ground at the moment and even more are held inside. Tears for loved ones, the doctors and nurses traumatized by what they're enduring daily, tears of those struggling with fear and anxiety and depression, those who uh, feel they're losing their mind, tears of those whose lives have been turned upside down, lost jobs and lost income, businesses, university plans, hopes, holidays, all of that stuff. This sense that everything has been shaken and many people are completely shattered. Our earth is a planet in shock. I had a text message last Friday from a friend of mine who happens to be a government minister. And they simply said this, first time today, I had a wee weep. First time today, I had a wee weep. Ecclesiastes says that there is a time to mourn, to weep, to lament. And this is just such a time. The first thing I want to underline for us this morning is this, that Jesus wept real tears. He wept real tears. Many of you will know that uh, the last Sunday is traditionally in the Anglican Church and in others called Low Sunday. I think it's to do with attendance rather than mood. And in the ancient lectionary of uh, set readings for it, it's named Quasimodo as you all know, uh, and you can Google later why it's called such from the Latin 1 Peter 2, things like that. But one of the set readings for last Sunday is Isaiah 53, 3 to 5. And there we have Isaiah's vision of Jesus, the Messiah. And we're told that he is a man of sorrows. That was the impression. That was the revelation that Isaiah received of the Messiah a man of sorrows, one who is familiar with suffering and acquainted with grief. The shortest verse in the English translation of the Bible in John 11 is that Jesus wept. It's been turned into a, a, a swear word, but it's a wonderful sentence. It's a beautiful thing. Jesus wept. And he wept at the tomb of his dear friend, he wept over Jerusalem. The writer to the Hebrew says he wept in prayer, loud cries and tears. He weeps over the world. God weeps with those who weep. Tears of empathy and sadness and loss and protest. Jesus never says buck up, he never says man up. He never dismisses cries. He's never patronizing. He tenderly moves towards those who are broken. You know, machines don't cry. You've got to be a human to cry. You have to be alive. You have to have a heart to feel and to cry and to experience pain and loss and regret. Animals don't cry. Whilst all animals have tear ducts to moisten their eyes, none, with the possible exception of elephants, cry with emotion. We, we've all heard of crocodile tears, but they cry when they eat their prey. Vegetables don't cry. According to researchers, though, at the Institute for Applied Physics in the University of Bonn, plants release gases that some physicists say may be the equivalent of crying out in pain. But humans cry. And they cry because they suffer. And they cry because they feel. To cry is to be human. It suggested the average individual in a lifetime shed 60 litres of tears. In the history of humankind, that's a whole ocean of weeping. I think our first ancestors were created with tear ducts hooked to emotion centres in the brain, there to 
be released at moments of joy. But sin and the fall rewires us and the first tears of pain are shed by our first ancestors. And we've been crying ever since. There's so much pain in our world. There's so much suffering. The psalmist speaks of the world as the valley of Baca, a valley of tears, of weeping. I read yesterday that 70% of the Psalms have lament. I don't know if that's accurate. I'll need to follow it up. But it wouldn't surprise me. So often in church, we fake it. And we put on a show, especially in my tradition, the charismatic tradition. Often there can be these days the sort of hype and a worked up and whipped up an inauthenticity that simply doesn't reflect people's lived experiences, especially at the moment, but not just at the moment. Most weeping over most pain goes unwitnessed. It's behind closed doors. The weeping of a wife whose husband has dementia and no longer knows her. The weeping of a couple whose IVF failed yet again. The weeping of a partner whose spouse has abandoned them for a younger model. The weeping from a student shrouded in depression. Weeping of a child who grows up never knowing their father. The weeping from a man who lost his job and his dignity and climbed into a bottle. The weeping in the cold of the night of a man shaking, frozen, living rough in a shop doorway. And even big boys cry. My best pal is called Mark Davies. He served for 17 years in the British SAS and before that in the parachute regiment. He told me that he cries at funerals of his friends killed in battle. He told me that he wept and it still haunts him when in Bosnia 20 years ago, he came across a human hill of dead women and children, just wept and wept inside ever since. Victor Hugo in Les Miserables says, only those who do not see do not weep. But God sees and God cares. And he weeps. In the Old Testament, he sends Moses to rescue Israel from the Egyptians with that lovely sentence. I've, I've always loved it. I have heard their cry and I know their sorrow. He's a man of sorrow and he's acquainted with his own and with our sorrow. He's not distant. He's not absent. He's not indifferent. He's not like the Greek gods who were apathetic, apatheia, indifferent, unmoved. He's not the philosopher's unmoved mover. Jesus wept. That's the first thing I want to underline for us this morning. Jesus wept. He understands and he's hurt and hurting. Secondly, Jesus wiped away the tears. He wept, but he also wiped them away. I love that hymn, did e'er such love and sorrow meet? Yes, it did. it did. In Jesus, love meets sorrow in Jesus. Mary Magdalene in our reading had cried herself to sleep nights without number. There were demons within and darkness without, but then she met Jesus and everything was different. It changed everything. Mark's gospel tells us that Mary Magdalene had been freed from seven demons. Just imagine the torment she endured. Ancient tradition tells us that Mary Magdalene had been a prostitute. She's described as having lived a sinful life. And Magdala in the Talmud uh, is called the city of prostitutes. And I wonder if she's given that predicate, that name, because uh, it indicates her past life. It's a way of the gospel writers telling us who she was. No girl grows up wanting to be a prostitute, objectified and trapped like a lump of meat and used and abused and defiled. I think Mary knew what it was to cry tears of pain and shame and loss and sorrow. And then one day she met Jesus. And that changed everything. And it changed her. And she gate crashes a party and she wept Jesus' feet with her tears, this time tears of gratitude. But here we meet her Easter morning and she's been crying since Thursday night. 
She'd been crying since she heard that Jesus had been betrayed and arrested and abandoned by the disciples and then uh, put through a, 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 trump, a, a trial with trumped up charges, sentenced, flogged and murdered. She'd been crying for days. And on Sunday, early before dawn, she goes to the tomb and she goes to cover the body in spices and scent with other women. And as Mary arrives, to her dismay, the stone is rolled away and there is no body. She thinks it's been taken. She gets Peter and John, she comes back and she lingers at the tomb. Peter and John left, but she stayed in that last place where he had been because she just wanted to be near him. Even the memory of where he'd been. And in verse 11 of chapter 20, Mary stands outside weeping. And as she wept, she looks in. And the two angels say, why are you weeping? And then she turns around. She says, they've taken away my Lord. I don't know where. And then she turns around and there is Jesus. And he says, why are you weeping? Four times in a couple of verses, it mentions weeping. She was weeping. She wept. The angels say, why are you weeping? The Lord says, why are you weeping? Why? Poet Edgar Allan Poe in 1847, the year his wife died, wrote these words, deep in earth my love is lying and I must weep alone. That's why she's crying. She's lost the only one who ever meant anything to her, who ever did anything for her, her Lord. I like the fact she says they've taken away my Lord. Jesus doesn't despise her tears, but he prizes them. They're tokens of her love. She thinks he's the gardener. If you've moved him, tell me where. And Jesus speaks to her and just says, Mary. And she knows him, Rabbi, <laughs> and throws her arms around him. There's a beautiful line in an Easter poem by Malcolm Jeet. I don't know if that's how you pronounce it. That's how I read it. And uh, he's, it's about Mary. He says this, she hears love say the word that turns her night and ours to day. Love speaks the word Mary and turns her night and ours to day. Or if you're a bit cooler with Bob Marley, no woman, no cry. Everything's going to be all right. Once again, Jesus turns her tears of sadness to tears of joy. And Mary is the first to go to Jesus before dawn. And Mary is the first that Jesus appears to. He appears to the weeping woman. And Mary is the first to be commissioned to go and tell others the gospel. She's the first evangelist. She is the apostle to the apostles. And what a message she's got that Jesus is risen. That wipes away the tears. The resurrection, as I finish, signifies the time limit on tears. The resurrection means that God is at the helm of history. The resurrection means that Jesus is Lord over death and he's Lord of life. And the resurrection means that sins were fully atoned for at the cross and his death was a sufficient substitution and sacrifice for the sins of the world. The resurrection means that death has died. The resurrection means that eternity has been ushered in. The resurrection means that the demonic's days are numbered and counting. The resurrection means that those who hope in Jesus will rise again and reign with him. The fact of the resurrection enables us to look through tear-filled eyes with hope. And as we look at the world and the litany of tragedy and pain and sorrow with everything out of kilter we have a message of hope that wipes away tears yeah while we're alive and until the lord returns there is cause for lament but there is also cause for rejoicing my mum let me finish with this my mum when i was growing up would often say to me it will end in tears and what she meant was that if I didn't stop messing around, there would be trouble. And either uh, I would get smacked, and that would be tears, or I would cause trouble and we'd all be crying. 
it will end in tears. But here's the thing, because Jesus came, because he died for our sins, because he rose again, because he's reigning in heaven, and because he's coming back, it won't end in tears. It will be the end of tears. Jesus wept and Jesus wiped. And I don't know what the church is going to look like when we come back and come out of this lockdown. But whatever it looks like, whatever new models of church, whatever new methods of missiology, this one thing doesn't change, that we're the people of hope, that God understands and God sends us in the power of the Spirit with the gospel to stand and weep with those who weep, but also filled with hope to wipe away those tears. Amen. Well, I'll hand back now to Dale. Once again, thanks very much for having me with you. Simon, thank you so much for that. Um, before we reflect a moment, I do want to thank you to make sure we do that before you exit the virtual room. And uh, thank you for the three gospel cameos that you promised us in that first one, and they've all shown us Jesus. That's the highest and maybe most challenging call of any teacher or preacher, that uh, despite the limitations of being in a screen and on the screen, uh, the Spirit's taken the word that you've opened to us, and we've not just heard about Jesus. But we met with Jesus. You've shown us Jesus. You've brought us back to Jesus. And we thank you for that. Thank you very much. Hearing those words, uh, I want us just to reflect on an aspect of our hope in the future from Revelation chapter 21, part of the revelation to St. John, and to hear those well-known words that our, that our hope is not a vague we wish, but it's a hope uh, we believe because, because of Jesus. So let me read from Revelation chapter 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more, neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. Let me pray for us for a moment. Gracious God, we thank you for the promise of your presence, for the renewal of heaven and earth. Thank you that you lead us through these times not around them but that in jesus we have a sure hope father thank you that today simon has helped us stand with those and ourselves with the real pain of life and yet lifts our eyes and hearts and minds to the glory of the risen christ in his name we pray amen well, the conference is drawing to a virtual conclusion and a real conclusion. And there's a few things that we want to do just before we finish. Uh, among them, I want to say thank you to a few people on everyone's behalf. I've, I've to thank Simon, but it doesn't hurt to do that again, because thank you for that outstanding work you've done. And somehow, despite the screen, there's been that imminence and, and, and connection by the Spirit. So thank you. Um, thanks to... Uh, all the team have been involved in putting this together. I've been a tiny partner. Others have done a great deal more. I need to thank uh, Richard, who's kind of held the thing together and navigated uh, uh, helpfully through us, uh, navigated it through. And uh, he hasn't used the mute all button too much. And when he has, he hasn't looked as though he's enjoying it too much, which I know 
you really will have been. Uh, thank you to the rest of the team, especially, especially Ben, who I think has shown us just how much fun you can have in a garden shed with a green screen. So thanks, but thank you to everybody who's been involved in the team. And I know the team back at ICS office there, uh, we've seen the work of Jemima and Yelena and Jeanette and others, but thanks to all the background team, often get forgotten, but who are working from home and are helping to keep things going. Well, we are gonna to come to a, a proper conclusion and not just fade away. It, this is kind of the stage in the conference, if we'd been meeting in High Lee, uh, we'd be finishing, uh, we'd be reflecting on just how many full English breakfasts can you eat in a week? Excuse me while I wipe away a small tear as I ponder those. <laughs> um, and also we've been having the kind of conversations that you have going between the last session and actually leaving like in the car park on the way to the bus. And that's what we'll have in the breakout rooms a bit later. The, the conference will be over, but we'll still be chatting to people kind of as we go our way. And in a few minutes, we're gonna hear from uh, Bishop Richard, who's gonna send us on our way. But really just to give a, a resounding thanks to you as well, for everyone who has joined us through the medium of Zoom. And uh, despite the restrictions we've had for making a meaningful connection with one another. It's been great to, to do this. We, we look forward to another year in Beatenburg, of course, and we look forward to hopefully not having to maintain a safe distance, who knows at that time, but actually being able to, to have that connection that we've talked about today in a literal and physical way. So we pray for, for one another as we meet in the future, we trust. But for now, I'd like to hand over to Bishop uh, Richard, as as we've... Friends, I, I do hope that you've uh, enjoyed um, being together, albeit somewhat virtually. Um, it was lovely to have C, uh, Simon teaching us. Simon is uh, a great friend. We were at Theological College together, uh, and so I followed his ministry with great interest and uh, been hugely blessed by his teaching over the course of, uh, of many years. So it was lovely to, to be reminded to this over these few days of some of these great truths. I was just reflecting actually that today is St. George's Day um, and it's uh, an interesting festival isn't it St. George's when you when you see uh, some of the uh, rather uh, unpleasant right-wing groups that so mark the political life of our country as they um, uh, you know parade the St George's Day flag and uh, venerate St George as an icon of Englishness when in fact he came from Turkey and uh, wasn't British at all um, and uh, it's just an interesting reflection on how symbols can be hijacked and reflect and, and used for all sorts of unfortunate unfortunate purposes um, but actually uh, St George being uh, embraced as a patron saint by our country is a is a wonderful uh, example of a sort of multiculturalism and uh, a symbol too of the fact that we as a, involved in ICS cross over a variety of cultures and, and embrace the best from all sorts of different cultures and lead churches that are a delightful mixture of people from every background and uh, uh, and tribe and uh, across the world. It's 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 a wonderful thing. I think um, what what I really want to encourage all of you is is around the whole area um, of self care. I've just got off a a meeting. I I think I've got thirty two Zoom meetings this week. Uh, I can't remember which number one I've just had. Um, but, but actually how important it is that we look after ourselves. I think, you know, we, there's, there, there's sort of the adrenaline rush, which sort of fuels this sort of quasi mania that, that got everything up, up and running in terms of um, systems and things. And I think I'm sensing that quite a number of people are, are coming to that place where they're a bit sort of flat um, and the diary's opening up a bit and if we're the sort of people who sort of feel we have to be active to justify our own existence, um, that can be quite a stressful time because you're thinking, oh, you know, why should we be doing something? And whilst it's really important that we do connect with people, I think, uh, pastorally through phone calls and all those sorts of things, 
I think it's really also important that we take care of ourselves and actually give ourselves permission to just chill a bit and not to feel driven to be frantically busy the whole time. Um, so I, 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 I hope that that might be the case for you and that you're enable, able to use, you know, the time a little bit for your own personal reflection and reading and, and not feel bad and, and driven about it. And um, I just want to sort of send out a, that, that message. I'm trying to sort of say that to lots and lots of people that, that you know, now is a time for re reflection and taking care of ourselves and recognizing that ministry is a marathon, not a sprint. And this is not going to be something that's over in five minutes and that we're going to be suddenly back to the way we were. We are going to have to start reflecting on different ways of doing things and different ways of working. So that's all I wanted to say. That's uh, my sort of sage advice for the day. And I hope that's, I hope that's helpful. And I, maybe I could just sort of finish by praying a prayer for all of us and uh, asking for God's blessing uh, as we continue serving him. So let's pray. Father God, thank you that you call each one of us into your service. Thank you, Lord, that the word that you speak over us are the same words that you spoke over your beloved son, Jesus. You are my child, the beloved, in whom I'm well pleased. Thank you, Lord, that we don't have to justify our existence by frenetic activity. But Lord, we always move into ministry from a place of rest and help us, Lord, to use uh, the times that we have to reflect and to pray uh, and to trust in your grace surrounding us. And Lord, may you bless each one of us in your service and help us at this time to draw close to you, to use this time to grow deeper in our understanding of who you are and how much you love us. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among us and remain with us always. Amen.